along through your own Bibles. Um, there was a book that was quite popular when I was younger, um, like a teenager-ish, not, not too long ago, maybe like 10, 15 years ago. Um, it topped the New York Times bestseller list and it topped the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Uh, it was the hottest book at the time and it was a Christian book. It was a Christian book. It was super, super popular, written by a Christian author. And uh, I'm going to put on the on this slide and I reckon most of us have either read it or you'll recognize it. It's a book called The Purpose Driven Life by the American pastor Rick Warren. The, the book was so extremely popular, not just among Christians, but among non-Christians as well. And in fact, it's actually quite popular still today. Um, recently, there was a, there's a famous sort of English um, comedian by the na name of Russell Brand. You, you may or may not know him, but he sort of went viral th this year because he's, um, he's becoming a Christian. And, and he posts these videos about himself becoming a Christian. And, and he, he spoke about how he'd been reading the Bible as well as this book. Um, but as you can tell, like, the reason why this book is so popular, if you can sort of see just from the title, is um, it, it addresses something that's quite sort of universal, something that people want to know about, and that's purpose, right? The, what's the purpose of our life? What's the meaning of life? And, and Rick Warren, in this book, he says, look, if you read this book, you're going to find out, you're going to know what God's purpose is for your life. You're going to understand the big picture, how all the pieces of your life actually fit together. That's his promise for those who read the book. Um, and he says, having this perspective will reduce your stress. It will simplify your decisions. It will increase your satisfaction. And most importantly, it will prepare you for eternity. Now, I, I, I'm not going to recommend or, or not recommend you read this book. Uh, I'm not going to review the book. I think there's a lot of good things in the book. Um, but also not so great things. Um, but the, the question it tries to answer, the question of purpose and meaning is universal. And people, and the fact that it's a bestseller tells us that people want to know. They, they want to know that life isn't random. E every single one of us, we want to know that there is a purpose to life. There is a purpose to every single day of our lives that life isn't random. That the things we experience in life isn't just a matter of chance. And, and, and the Bible agrees to that general statement. And the Bible says the way we find purpose to every day is by meeting God who in his loving wisdom prepares us for his purposes. So we're, we're going to look at that in this passage, in chapter 41, together, and see how God was at work in Joseph's life and how he's at work in ours today as well. And, and the way we're going to do that is through sort of two big headings. We're going to think about Joseph's long wait and God's loving wisdom. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this chapter in Genesis, um, yeah, chapter 41, where we see Joseph go from being in prison, waiting for a long time to somehow being made second in command of all of Egypt. Uh, help us to see what this has to say to us about how you work in our lives today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just a bit of context for, for those of us who uh, are joining us for the first time or we just need a bit of a memory jog. Joseph is the person that we're uh, following in the story of Genesis recently. He's from the family line of Abraham, uh, and, and that's God's chosen family, and, and that family is going to one day become Israel. Uh, Joseph is playing a big part in that story. He's a key character in this story um, because we see that God is bringing about the fulfillment of his promises to Abraham through Joseph. Joseph is favored, he's blessed, by God. He's going to be a blessing to others. We've seen that already, but, but really we see that uh, in the biggest way when he becomes prime minister and, and he comes up with this plan of, of saving food for the famine. Um, he's been exalted. He's been made great. Uh, he sets this expectation that Israel 
is really well on its way to being a great nation. He, he's sort of the beginning of that. Um, um, but at the same time, we see that as much as Joseph has been favoured and blessed, he's also experienced lots of different trials. Uh, his, his life has been a series of ups and downs. He's been exalted, but he's also been really humiliated. He's been remembered, but as Harry reminded us, he's also been forgotten. And today, we finally see how God, after many, many years, places Joseph in the position that he's been preparing him for. Joseph goes from being a prisoner to being a prince or, or a prime minister. He goes from prison to the palace. And here's what I think this story teaches us. As we follow Joseph in his journey, and he's given this high position in the kingdom after so many years, we're being taught through Joseph that God doesn't give us the experiences of our life by random. He doesn't give the experiences of our life by random, but in those experiences, through those experiences that he gives us, under his sovereign grace, in everything that we go through, God is actually preparing his people. God is preparing us. God is preparing you for his purpose of service and ministry. That's what we see in Joseph. His life hasn't been random. It, it, all the good and the bad hasn't been random, it's been God preparing him for his purpose of service and ministry. And more likely than not, that process of preparation is going to take up almost all, if not completely all, of our lives. Because think about it. What has it taken for Joseph to finally become the second most powerful man in Egypt? And it's not just that it's taken so long because, you know, Joseph has been this complete idiot, um, but it's really been more about what God has been doing, hasn't it? In fact, in a lot of ways, Joseph has been really good. He's been a faithful servant. He's done well. He's had success. And yet, God has somehow been at work. He's put him up, but he's also put him down. Joseph... Uh, we see that Joseph has actually grown through this because Joseph has gone from a kid who was probably a bit too loved by his dad and um, a little bit out of touch with reality. And he, you know, if you remember the story, he'd run down the stairs to tell everyone, hey, guess what I dreamt last night? You know, you guys were all bowing down to me, even mum and dad, and everyone got, like, what are you talking about? Um, and they got really angry. But God has been teaching him. God, Joseph has learned to be humble. He's learned to be patient. He's actually learned to be someone who's, who's in charge, who's in favor, but in his position, instead of inciting jealousy from those that he's been placed over, like his brothers, he's actually been, as we saw last week, he's been someone who's actively concerned about their welfare, like the cupbearer and the baker. Instead of being a dreamer, he's become an interpreter of dreams. God has been shaping Joseph in some way. But it's been a long process, right? It's been a really long process. Joseph was sold off as a slave when he was 17. And this chapter tells us that Joseph is 30 years old when he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. And, and of course, okay, 30 years old to be the prime minister of a country um, is pretty young. But that's not the point. The point is 13 years have passed. That's a long time. It is a long time. But actually... I actually think that that's a short time compared to some of the other characters in the Bible. Because if we think about some of the other characters in the Bible and the way that God has sort of made them wait or, or, or given them experiences to take them from one place to another, um, Abraham was 75 years old when God said, hey, you're going to have a child. How long did it take for Abraham to wait to have a son? He was 100 when he had a son. He waited 25 years. Um, Jacob. It took Jacob almost 30 years to go, away, to go from the, the guy who ran away from home in fear because he was a thief and a liar. It took him 30 years to return as someone who was finally aware of his need to rely on God. And even then, after 30 years, we know he was far from perfect. Moses, 
don't know who Moses is. Moses was 40 years old when he killed a man and he ran away. And when God speaks to him from the burning bush, and, and he says, look, I'm going to send you, go, go speak to Pharaoh uh, and, and lead my people uh, free from slavery, Moses is 80 years old. So 40 years passed for Moses. See, the pattern of the way that God works throughout the Bible is that he prepares his people for his purpose, his service, his ministry, and he does it over very long periods of time. Years and years and years. Which means, at the, uh, at the very least, we have to ask ourselves today, well, what is God then doing in my life to prepare me for his good purpose because there might be long extended lessons that he's teaching us, that he's, that he's taking us through. Maybe you're in it right now and we have to ask, well, how, did, how then, if, if we say, look, that's what God does and, and we see that in the Bible and we reflect on the last 10, 15, 20 years of our lives, what, what has it what is it that God has been doing in those years to grow me into someone who is being prepared? What is God teaching me in those years? And, and also then, how will the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years of my life continue to prepare me for God's service and ministry? It, it doesn't happen by random. God is preparing Joseph and he's preparing people, he's preparing you and me for long, long periods of time. But as I say this, I actually do want to make clear that, you know, when I say that God is preparing us and, and you know, he, he's doing something in us and, and he's made Joseph wait and, and Joseph's being forgotten and, um, and he's gone to prison and all those things, I do want to make clear that the things that are wrong in our lives do need to be pointed out as, as wrong. Let's, like, let's make that clear. The Bible isn't saying, it's not condoning abuse or commanding people to stay in abusive situations because that's God-ordained and suffering and, and growing us. That's not what the Bible is saying. But it is saying, even in the worst situations, even in situations that are drawn out and seem hopeless, even then somehow... We are being prepared for God's good purpose to bring glory to Him. Nothing in our life, in our life is random. And I, and I want to highlight that through the way Joseph interacts with Pharaoh. The way Joseph interacts with Pharaoh tells us that Joseph knows that everything that has happened in his life actually hasn't been for random. So Pharaoh has two dreams. He's got seven uh, fat cows that are eaten up by seven skinny cows. And then he has a dream about seven fat uh, heads of grain being swallowed up by seven skinny heads of grain. And, um, and, no, and no one can tell Pharaoh what it means, and he's frustrated. The cupbearer remembers Joseph, and jo Joseph is brought to Pharaoh. And so listen to what they say to each other, because I think there's a couple of things we can learn from here. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. No one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that... When you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph says, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And then we skip down, and Joseph tells him what the dream means, and he says, it's just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. Verse 32, the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And Joseph comes up with a plan on how to do it. And he says, look, you should find someone wise uh, to, to sort of you know, carry out the plan. And Pharaoh says, look, can we find anyone else like you? You have the Spirit of God. You are wise. And he makes Joseph second in command. Now, I want to, there are two things that Joseph does in this interaction with Pharaoh that I want us to see. Because Joseph begins, he, he's, the first thing he says to Pharaoh is he says, look, I can't do it, but God's going to give you the answer. 
And then he says, the reason the dream was given to you in two forms is to show you that whatever's happening has been firmly decided by God. God is going to do this. This has been decided by God. And I really think that this is a fascinating detail. Joseph is saying, <laughs> Joseph is saying that the same thing that, that, he, that has happened to him, that, that he said to the cupbearer and the baker, he's saying it to God. His time in prison, his time being forgotten, hasn't changed Joseph, but rather it's actually made him more grounded in the fact that God is in control. His time in prison has, has made Joseph even more confident in his trust in the power and wisdom of God because not only was he willing to say, hey, you know, cupbearer and baker, God's doing something, even when he stands in front of Pharaoh, he doesn't change his track. He says the same thing. And he says that it's not that just God interprets the truth or interprets dreams. He says that the fact that you had the, the dream twice means that whatever is going to happen is something that has been decreed or ordained or decided by God. And it's really interesting because the whole story of Joseph is a pattern of two, isn't it? Joseph favored twice, humiliated twice, two dreams by Pharaoh, two dreams by Pharaoh's servants, and of course, right in the beginning of the story, we had two dreams by Joseph. And Joseph is telling Pharaoh, and the Bible is telling us that God not only interprets life, that God isn't just a lens by we can understand life and improve our life, but actually God is the one who ordains our life. God doesn't just know what is, He doesn't just know what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen because He's ordained it to happen. See, nothing in your life happens by random chance. God is in control. I read an article uh, this past week. It's on the Gospel Society and Culture website. I put a link to it at sun.kwy.ch. You can, you can scroll down to the sermon outline. One of the committee members um, wrote an article sharing her experience of losing her child. Um, she had a three-month-old son who she put down um, just a normal day, regular nap time, and, um, and the child never woke up again. And she wrote a short article, and she ended up by saying this. She said, look, I don't write this article for shock or for gloom. However, it's important to be real. It's truly awful. I didn't think I'd ever feel okay again. Death is the complete antithesis of life. When we face death square on, it's reasonable to feel disdain for the ravages of sin in God's world. In the words of the poet, we are indeed to rage, rage against the dying of the light. But God is eternal. And we as creatures stamped with his image are created to enjoy life in good relationship with him and each other. When death comes, we, comes, we are faced with the vestiges of our broken humanity. Therefore, it is wise to learn to value our days. They may be many and they may be few. But when we are in Christ, nothing can destroy our joy. Not even death can overcome it. You know, some of us have walked with people who have gone through a similar loss. But even then, even as we recognize and feel the awfulness, the difficulty, the sadness of life at its absolute worst, even then, God is at work to bring us, as she says, to bring us more firmly into the joy of Christ, but also like she does through the article, to point others to it as well. See, if everything is a part of God's sovereign providence, if nothing in life is by random chance, even the worst parts of our lives, then we can take great encouragement that as hard as things might be, it's not random. It's not bad luck. It's not karma. It's not for you to just suck up and rationalize and make a reason for you to somehow work through but God is preparing you for his purpose to serve and to be served by, to minister and to be ministered to, to know the eternal and indestructible joy of being in him. 
There's nothing that can actually ground us through all of life experiences apart from such a big thing as God himself. Now, in order for us to really understand this, we have to bring it back to God because if we know what God is doing, like, okay, you know, God, life isn't random uh, and he's giving us experiences for the purpose of molding us and maturing us, we actually also need to know why, why God can do it. We, we have to know why is it that, that if our life isn't random and if we're supposed to be encouraged by the fact that, that the, the worst parts of our lives are controlled by God, why can God do this? And the reason why can, God can do this and the reason why that we can find encouragement from it is ultimately because God is loving and wise. God is loving and wise. Now, Joseph has two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. And look at verses 51 and 52. He says, hey, firstborn Manasseh, Manasseh he says, look, I'm going to name you that because it's God has made me forget all my trouble and all, and all my father's household. And he says, my second son, it's because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. God has made me forget all of my trouble. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Both names tell us that Joseph is on one hand rejoicing that God has blessed him, but it also tells us about how painful Joseph's life has been, doesn't it? The reality is that Joseph, in public, on the outside, has all the success that he could ever want in the world. He's second in command of Egypt, and he's not even from Egypt. But in private, his life is a life of pain. Joseph carries with him an ache, a scar that, that can't be healed, the pain of being separated from his family, the pain of being sold by his brothers, the, the pain of living in a foreign land as a stranger. But the amazing news, and, and, and the amazing news that even Joseph doesn't fully know yet, is that God is somehow using Joseph to overturn everything that's wrong. We know God is going to overturn Pharaoh's dream about the famine. He's going to reverse it. He's going to bring blessing instead of the curse. He's going to bring life where there is death. But also in Joseph's personal life, Joseph, in a couple of chapters, is going to meet his family again. See, God, in his loving wisdom, is always able to bring about his good purpose for us He's always able to bring up into us the fullness of who we are becoming, what life really is about. And in the New Testament, um, the Apostle Paul, he tells the church, hey guys, look, you know, there, there's actually, my life isn't that great. Um, you, you know, I, I, I go on mission and I'm doing all of this gospel stuff, but, and, and you know, I... But, but let me tell you that there's something in my life that I've been praying to God to take away from me. He says, uh, something's been hurting him. He's had a thorn in the flesh, he calls it. And he's prayed and prayed and prayed for God to take it away. But God doesn't. And this is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and in persecutions and in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. See, the secret to understanding the brokenness of life, the long periods of pain, the long periods of being forgotten, uh, the thorns in our flesh is to say, when I am weak, then I am strong because I know God is a wise and loving God whose grace is sufficient for me. His power is made perfect in my weakness. And someone might say, look, but why would, why, why would an loving God, let bad things happen to us in the first place? And I, I, and I won't fully answer that question because that's a massive question. Um, and, it was in, and Harry, I don't know if you remember, Harry, um, when he was opening up, he, 
he said, um, he used the line, how long, O Lord? Am I the only one that remembers? He used the line, how long, O Lord? But he, and actually, that's a really good line because there's a book called How Long, O Lord by a man named Don Carson or D.A. Carson. Um, if you have questions about you know, why would God let this happen, um, you know, allow suffering to happen, and, and how do I understand it as a Christian, I really highly recommend you that book. But I will say this, even though I won't give you the full answer, I will say the Bible confronts us with the fact that evil, bad things, happens to people as a result of sin. That doesn't mean that one bad event is a direct consequence of sin. It doesn't mean that like, your life is a series of you did bad thing, God's punishing you. Um, and it also doesn't mean that we should brush off any sort of bad event or suffering away as, oh, I deserve it because I am a sinner. But at the same time, the truth is, evil entered the world through sin, and we're all sinners. Which means, when we think about our lives and we think about our suffering and, and the times where we feel like these are long periods of waiting or, or, or being in prison or, or being forgotten, we actually have to remember that it's not that bad things happen to good people. To assume that we are good people and bad things are happening to good people is actually false. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we are all evil. We're all under the wrath of God. And the story of the Bible is not that bad things happen to good people, but actually that good things happen to bad people. And if that's true, if it's true that the story of our lives is not actually that bad things happen to good people, but that good things happen to bad people, then it tells us all the blessings we enjoy today are signs of God's loving patience towards us and all of our weaknesses all of our thorns, all of our suffering is a cause to bask in God's grace. The, the good news that we have to take away is that the only way we can truly understand our purpose through the lens of God's loving wisdom is by seeing that God's love is, for us is so deep that He led him to send his son Jesus to live, suffer, and even die for us on the cross so that we would know that our life is actually purposeful and redeemed by the one who is in control. You know, the, the, the funny thing is, if we think about Jesus, Jesus also lives a life where he waits a long time. Jesus begins his public ministry at around 30 years of age. He's killed on the cross at 33 years of age. And apart from a few stories about Jesus as a child, the Bible really summarizes the first 30 years of Jesus' life in a very short verse. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That's how it summarizes Jesus' First 30 years of his life. And then, once he dies, Hebrews chapter 5 summarizes Jesus' life in this way. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Even Jesus, the Bible says, was being prepared by God for the purpose that which he had come, the service of God's glory, the service of God's people, the ministry of the gospel that peaks at his death on the cross and in the resurrection. And because Jesus also went through this, just like we do, it tells us that Jesus came as fully God and fully human. He's someone who experienced and learned and grew in maturity, just like we do. And because he's done that, 
we can go to another verse in Hebrews that tells us we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us in our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Whatever it might be that you are going through, your long, arduous process, uh, let me encourage you. Use it. Pray through it. Learn the sufficiency of God's grace because he's sovereign over all of your circumstances. Even when things are hard, God is still working out his plan so that even our problems can help us fulfill our purpose. And remember that in all of our suffering, we're tasting the same growing pains that even Jesus knows. And he stands ready to help you persevere until that process is complete. Let's pray. And Father, we do thank you that you are a high priest. You're, you're a God, you're a savior, you're a king who knows what your people go through. You know what your people go through, not just from a theoretical or intellectual level, but you really lived it, you experienced it. You came as fully God and fully human. Help us to know through this story of Joseph that you are sovereign and because we know that you are the loving and wise father of our lives, we can take encouragement. We can have hope that you are working out your purpose in us as you grow us for the purpose of service and ministry to glorify you and to point others to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.